Hi kids. All right, so here's some advice to you guys. Plus, at the end of this, right after the advice part, which is sh relatively short, <laughs> is some uh, some family history. Okay, that, in my opinion, is a really interesting part. All right, so I'll uh, learn something about fighting, but don't fight. Walk away from a situation that's escalating into a fight. Don't let yourself be manipulated by a group or an individual into a fight. A lot of times someone is trying to manipulate you, it'll be blah, 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 never, never, never justifies actually physically contacting someone, hitting someone, okay? You never, ever, ever want to attack someone. You never want to hit someone first, ever, okay? The famous Shaolin monks, the martial artists of China, all right? They're all men of peace. They never attack. They never hit first. They never start a fight. Uh, what you need to know is how to protect yourself and how to throw a punch, all right? So, so uh, how to protect yourself. Um, boxing covers this very well, you know, by keeping your guard up, protecting yourself so you don't get hurt, and uh, how to put your body into a punch because if you don't know how to throw a punch, you're just flailing away, which is useless and ineffectual, all right? You, you want to know something about fighting, but you don't want to fight. You want to walk away from a group situation, an individual situation that's escalating into a fight always. There's no exceptions to that. And no one can ever say anything to you. Words, no matter how awful the words are, that justify hitting them. You don't want to get into fights ever. Okay? Uh, if you're really going to dedicate yourself to this stuff, go ahead, learn some martial arts. Which one doesn't matter, but just really practice, practice, practice. That's how you get good at fighting or anything else, okay? And um, if you're, you're not going to put in that much time on this, fine. That's fine. There's no reason to. Okay? Uh, learn something about boxing. Learn how to protect yourself and learn how to... Put your body into to a punch, how to throw a punch, all right? And that's enough about fighting. Again, the best part of fighting is walking away. Remember, there is always somebody bigger, better, faster, stronger, always. Maybe not right in front of you right now, but, you know, if you, you're going to get into fighting people for the sake of fighting people, that's not going to end well. There's, there's, there are people who like to hurt people. And there's always somebody bigger, better, stronger, okay? So don't even go there. Don't get into that. If a situation is escalating into a fight, walk away. Um, if it's a crowd that is, like, goading you into a fight, you can take command of a fight. Uh, take command of a crowd by uh, speaking confidently, by speaking commandingly. Hey, give me some room. All right, step back. You know, that kind of thing. By actually speaking confidently and commandingly, a crowd will listen to you. If you're sufficiently commanding and sufficiently confident, you can control a crowd with that, okay? All right. But enough about that. We're not getting into fights, are we? Okay? You really, really, really do not want to do that. So, some family history. So, both sides of my family, uh, the Ermans, which was my mother's side, and the Jacobis, which was my father's side, both sides brought some of the old country here with them. Now, the Armans, they lived in, uh, in Flushing, a few blocks, a few blocks north, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of Bound Park, over by St. Mel's Catholic Church. Okay, when they first moved in there, one day my grandfather was out, out on his front steps, and he saw a deer, he went back into the house, got his gun, and shot a deer in Flushing, <laughs> which is... Something you couldn't do these days, right? But that did actually happen way, way back when. Uh, which, of course, he would have gone over and dressed the carcass and they would have eaten the thing, you know? He's not a... To... Grandpa was not a waster. In his whole life, Grandpa threw out probably as much garbage as uh, Grandma and I throw out in a week. <laughs> they just did not throw things away. They used... Uh, coffee grounds on plants, eggshells were another thing that were beneficial for plants. They used everything, okay? So, um, his house, part of it being, you know, a little bit of the old country over here in Flushing, 
All right, his house, he had a, a cornfield, had an apple tree, a cherry tree, a pear tree. He had raspberry bushes, blackberry bushes. He had a big garage, two-car garage. He had a, a big house, and downstairs was a completely finished basement. A third of it was his shop, which was so clean you could eat off the floor. He had the floor painted, which was bare concrete. He had it painted with a deck paint. You know, oil-based deck paint like they use on boats. So the floor was painted with this gray deck paint, and it was it was spotless. There was there was no felt anywhere in that shop. You know, all the tools were arranged in very specific places. Any of the power tools, any of the machinery had a thin thin layer of oil, and you could smell the oil in this shop. You know, everything was fully cared for, fully maintained totally operational. It was like, wow, this is the neatest shop I've ever seen in my life, you know, but that that was the kind of guys they were. Now, the other two-thirds of their basement in Flushing was a huge banquet table. Now, Grandpa being a, this is Grandpa Ehrman, right? My mother's father. Now, that, this would be your great-great-grandpa Ehrman. All right. So, he was a carpenter. So this huge banquet table that they had in the basement, he chances are he made it because I've never seen anything like that. It was it was huge. It covered like the whole basement. And this was a big house. I've seen oh 30, 40 people sitting at that one table. I mean it was enormous, right? Let's see how many people actually just doing a head count. You know, it's it's too difficult to do a count. But it was a it was a huge table, and they would have these big family dinners down there. They would they would uh, you know have all the relatives over. Uh, there was a bar underneath the stairs. He walked down the stairs to get to the basement, and under the stairs was a fully done wet bar, including schnapps. This was where Grandpa would make his schnapps. Now schnapps is German for hooch. <laughs> it's it's alcohol, alcohol drinks. There was a very sweet version of, of cherry juice that had a little bit of alcohol in it. That was for the kids. And there was schnapps. This was schnapps like, <coughs> I don't know, if you ran out of gas, you could probably pour schnapps in the tank and start your car. This this was the real thing. All right, that was for the grown-ups. That wasn't for the kids, all right? And he made this stuff. He, I mean, you know, that was one of the reasons, aside from, putting up mason jars full of fruit and vegetables and things. One of the reasons that they grew fruit was so he could make schnapps. All right. Um, oh, they also had a cornfield. <laughs> they had a, a, a lot on the one side of the house, and the lot was just a big empty space. And in the back, there's, uh, you're walking back. There's a patio area and a barbecue area. You walk back some more. There's the fruit trees. There's the fruit bushes. You walk back some more. There's a big garage. And there's a pen for, uh, well, they, they would keep uh, uh, geese and ducks and chickens in there, right? So there's a pen. And then if you went past the garage all the way back, and a cornfield. <laughs> How cool is that? In Flushing, at a cornfield. Now, the cornfield, much later, to build a house for my Uncle George and Aunt Dorothy, who are both now have passed away, but uh, to build a house for them, he took out the cornfield, and built their house over there. Now, see, that's interesting. That's, that's like, that's a Jewish tradition, but it was also a Slavic tradition for, uh, you know, my, my Catholic grandparents on my mother's side to have the whole family living in this ermine enclave, you know, so they would all be living with easy, within easy proximity of each other, okay? So the cornfield later became Uncle George's house, but that's, that's enough about that, okay? Now, my father's people, the Jacobis, which was properly spelled J-A-K-O-B-Y. The immigration people on Ellis Island changed it because they didn't think J-A-K-O-B-Y looked right. So they made it J-A-C-O-B-Y. But J-A-K-O-B-Y is the, you know, Austro-Hungarian spelling for this is an Austro-Hungarian name. J-A-C-O-B-I is a, a Jewish name, all right? So 
they kind of messed with his name and made it J-C-O-B-Y, as it is today, all right? Okay, now, the Jacobis lived in College Point, and uh, my grandparents, neither of them, ever drove. They were not drivers. They were local guys, okay? Uh, my grandfather worked and worked and worked, a very hard-working man, worked and worked and worked, in exchange for the house that he lived in, and they had a, a property next door. The property next door was a couple of apartments above a store. Okay, because this was kind of a busy little street. Local street, but kind of a busy street, a main drag. Uh, when I was a kid, the street was all cobblestones, and there were trolley car tracks. When my grandfather, my Grandpa Jacoby, when he was a younger man, the trolley would run past his house, and since he didn't drive, he could take the trolley wherever it was he had to go. If it was further than he cared to walk, he could always hop on the trolley, okay? So... So that was how he got around. Anyway, behind his house, this is the part that was like bringing Europe with you. This was absolutely surreal. All right. So he's got his house and he's got the rental property. The rental property had a store on the ground floor, which they closed up. They took out the storefront and made it a wall and it became all apartments. It was like a little mini apartment building, okay? Behind his house, all right, so you go out the back door, and you're in the, the, oh, carriageway. It's not really big enough to be a driveway, but I presume it was wide enough for, uh, like, a horse-drawn carriage to fit in there. This was also all cobblestone. So it's cobblestones. You had a rain barrel there, because Grandma used to save the rainwater to wash her hair in. She didn't like using tap water on her hair. She preferred to use rainwater. She felt it was better. And it was, uh, you know, better for her hair, okay? So that's why they saved the rainwater, which was a cool thing. I mean, these guys, these guys were into a, a, a way of living that was harmonious with nature, if being harmonious with nature includes slaughtering pigs and smoking the meat and stuff like that. All right. So back on this little virtual tour of the property. And it's unbelievable that this was in College Point, right? All right. So you go, you go out of the house. You're into the cobblestone, uh, uh, not really a driveway, carriageway, and you, you walk back from there. And now there's a, a, a flower garden and a vegetable garden, and you walk through that. And on the left is a building, a completely wooden, homemade building, and it's Grandpa's shop. And he had a savage German shepherd that was on a chain that... Uh, guarded the shop. This was not a house, though. This thing was never in the house, all right? This was strictly there as a savage dog to protect the shop. Grandpa didn't even discuss it. Like, my mother was in the hospital when I was a little, little kid. I was, what, a year or two years old? Anyway, uh, so I'm staying over there, and Grandma and Grandpa, they're very, very nice to me, but they would let me just run around. I could do whatever the hell I wanted, so I'm running around. And uh, wandering out in the back, and I heard the kachink kachink as he started to run at me. I could hear his chain kind of rattling. So I was able to get back from this monster that came <laughs> running at me. And after that, I, I gave, I steered clear of his shop, but he had power tools and things like that in there. So we thought, sure, why don't I have a, a killer dog? To greet anybody, that's going to try and rip off my stuff. All right. Then he had a, another building. All right. So that's on the left. Now, as you're facing into the backyard, that's on the left. In the middle, so this is behind the vegetable garden and the flower garden in the middle, there's another, I don't know, it's, it's, another, it's like a store building. You could keep things in it. You could pack things up in it. You could use it for storage. You could use it for woodworking. You could use it for... Whatever you needed, it was still another building, okay? Now, to the right of that, there was like a barn-like structure, and that was used for animals when they had animals on hand. For instance, they would have pigs occasionally, and yes, right there in Flushing, like the European immigrant savages that they were, they would slaughter pigs. They'd kill pigs and um, uh, bring the meat, 
Once they'd cleaned it and dressed it, they would bring the meat into the smokehouse, which was another one of the outbuildings. They, Grandpa built the smokehouse. And in the smokehouse, they would have washed. Oh, washed is another disgusting thing. <laughs> <But, laughs> just a minute for that. But they would, they would also smoke hams and pork shoulders and all these delicious cuts of meat. So they would smoke the meat in there, which is a, a means of preserving, you know, food, right? So you'd, you'd smoke it. And you could keep it and it would be fine. Now, worst is made by uh, grinding up pieces of pig, right? Mixing it with spices and salts and things like that, right? Uh, stuffing it into a cleaned portion of the pig's intestine and then hanging it from rafters, from boards in the smokehouse and smoking it. So, you know, you would have this, oh, what's it similar to? It's, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of like jerky, but not so civilized, right? Uh, my father's older brother, Uncle Mike, that was Grandpa Jacoby's first name, was Mikhail, you know, Mike. And uh, his son, his oldest son, was Mikhail. Not his first son. His first son was John. He had been married twice. His first wife died. So there was Uncle John. He was the, the older guy. Then there was there was Mike. That was his uh, grandpa's son with his, his, uh, his, his wife, right? Not his first wife, but his second wife, Grandma Jacoby. As long as I knew, I never met the first one. And um, Uncle Mike used to keep a hunk of washed in his back pocket. In case he got hungry, he would gnaw on that, and I do mean gnaw on that. This was, this was rough stuff. It'd probably last forever, but this was, this was, you know, like like an uncivilized version of jerky. This this was something you really could gnaw on, and yes, you could obtain nourishment from stuff from it, but uh, you know, this is this was primitive food. This is what they ate. They were into washed. They were into a lot of pork products, right? So, fine. Oh, chickens, too. They would slaughter chickens. But chickens, chickens you don't smoke. Chickens, when you have a dead chicken, you cook it and eat it. You make soup out of it. You make roast chicken out of it. You make whatever you're going to make out of it. But you cook it and you eat it. You do not uh, smoke a chicken. Just FYI. There's no smoking chickens. All right. So, what else? Um, okay. So, that's the Jacobis. You know what? I'm going to flip back and forth. Because I just, I just thought of another story involving the airmen. So, back to Flushing, okay? We're leaving College Point. Back to Flushing. And uh, there was a, a, a lot full of weeds across the street that wasn't part of their property. Right? Wasn't part of their property. This was just... You know, public property, or somebody owned it, or whatever, but it was weeds. My grandmother was of the idea, and she's probably right, that, that there were bugs that lived in the weeds. And Grandma was a bit of a bug herself. A fire bug. She actually liked fires. So, she would burn down the weeds every once in a while. She'd set fire to it, go in the house, call the fire department, because she didn't want to burn down the neighborhood, she just wanted to burn down the weeds. Call the fire department, then go out in her yard and watch when the fire department came to put it out. And after a while, they knew it was her. <laughs> they knew, they're not stupid people, they're fine. They knew that she was doing this, right? But what are you going to do? You know, the woods are on, the, the weeds are on fire. What do you do? You don't just let it burn. God knows how far it's going to go, right? So they would come and put it out. Anyway, that was, that was Grandma, the uh, pyromaniac. All right. Um, she was also a cleanliness fanatic. All right. Uh, grandma, grandma's house was so clean that it was like unbelievable. Un seriously, unbelievable. She had ashtrays, but they were all spotless. You could use her ashtrays as a cereal bowl. <laughs> they were all totally, completely sterile, spotless. Her floors were totally clean and shiny. All of her furniture was completely clean. 
everything was clean in her house. She was like a, a clean machine. Well, and that's because of how she grew up. She grew up as part of a big country family. And she, her job, she was basically from, uh, you know, she was 10, 11, 12, around there. You know, not quite a kid anymore. She was like a scullery maid. And she, her job was cooking, cleaning, making beds, doing laundry. She was, you know, a scullery maid. In fact, that's what she did when she was over here. When the Ermans first came to America, they, uh, 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 he was the super in a, a, uh, an apartment building. He was a super because in addition to being a carpenter, he was a generally handy guy. So he would fix the place if anything went wrong, right? And my grandma, she would keep the place clean. She would you know, wash the floors, sweep the floors, vacuum the rugs, keep the place clean. That was uh, her thing. And later, when they moved into their own house, which I've been describing, they took the money that they saved while he was being a super, and then they bought their own house, their own property, right? A lot of property. They, they bought their own stuff, and they... Uh, my grandmother continued to work. She would she would go out and she would clean. She'd clean people's houses, right? That, she didn't have other skills. She didn't have education. She didn't have other stuff going for her. But again, she was a cleaning maniac and an incredible cook, right? She would make uh, she would make cookies. She'd make fifteen different kinds of cookies with little layers of icing on them and jelly centers and stuff. I mean amazing gourmet type cooking, you know, but she didn't part with her recipes so easy, you know, she wouldn't tell people exactly how she did it, like, mom, that's my wife, uh, grandma, all right, she wanted to get the recipe for my grandmother's, your great grandmother's, uh, oven fried chicken, this came out like fried chicken, but it was made in the oven, right, it took a year and like, five, six tries to get all of the info from great-grandma because she didn't give it up all at once. The secret ingredient by, in that, by the way, is chicken broth. But that's, again, that's a story for another day. All right? Um, okay. Uh, so back to College Point. I'm going to wrap this up shortly. Back to College Point. So my grandfather, when I knew him, he was already an old guy. He was blind. He'd sit in a chair by the window so he could feel the sun on his face. He would go out and garden sometimes in the flowers. Even though he was blind, you know, he would go out and do gardening and do it by feel, you know, and by smell. And uh, when when my parents would bring me over there, well, I remember I'm a little kid, so my parents would bring me over there to visit uh, visit my grandfather, your great-grandfather, and uh, great-great-grandfather, <coughs> and he would... He would put his hand on my head. <laughs> he could see how tall I was. So, oh, you're big. <laughs> right? And uh, he smelled like camels. He smoked a couple of packs of camels every day. And cough drops. He had, what was it, Smith Brothers cough drops? Where they had the beards? Was that Smith Brothers? Might be the Smith Brothers. He had these cough drops, and he would give those out like party favors. Yeah, have a cough drop. <laughs> He was always nice to me. From what I heard, he was hell on wheels as a younger guy. But, you know, what, I, I, have, I have nothing but good things to say about the man. He was, he was very nice to me, okay? Um, all right, so that's Grandpa Jacoby. Oh, Grandma's maiden name, Fast Binder. Fast Binder. So there's another, another little tidbit, okay, on your ancestry. Fast Binder. Um... You know what? I think that's about enough right now. For right now, right? You got some advice on fighting, which is don't, and uh, you know a little bit about the Jacobis and the Hermans. These are my people. They brought the old country with them over here, you know, and uh, that was how they rolled. You know, they were not they were not so much into assimilating. I mean, they were into getting along. They wanted the kids to learn English. They made an effort to learn enough English to get by. You know. But they didn't want to lose their culture. They didn't. They didn't just lose their culture and and embrace embrace being Americans. Part of this is the notion that everybody from more than five miles away from the village 
that they grew up in are idiots. They don't know how to do anything. They do everything wrong. If you want to see how things are done right, you go visit their, their village. People do things right there. They slaughter the pigs properly. They smoke the pigs properly. They do everything correctly. Everybody else, they're morons. But, you know, that was, that's just, it's like a cultural thing. I don't know if it's German or if it's Hungarian or local or what the situation is, but that was the culture, okay? Anyway, if you're interested in more of this, I'll do some more. I'll tell you some more about, about where you came from. I'm not just making this up. I interviewed uh, my father, your great-grandfather. I interviewed him. For uh, half an hour, I have a video of that, though, you know, the, the sound didn't come out so good on it. You can hear me, of course, you can always hear me, but, you know, you, you don't hear him so good. And I have to talk even louder than my usual loud, annoying voice for him to hear me because he doesn't wear his hearing aid, which he needs in order to hear things. But that, he's another bag of chips. We're not going to get into that right now either. But anyway, if you want to hear more of this... Um, I'd be happy to tell you more about your ancestry, but ask sometime soon, <laughs> all right? I'm not going to be around forever. Um, a very, very interesting little interview would be uh, Grandma Lori and her sister and Valerie talking about that side of the family. Because between the two of them, they could come up with a whole lot of information about just what the deal was with those guys, all right? That's another interesting crowd. Okay, and that's all I got for today, all right? So happy trails, and uh, if you're interested, I'll be happy to do another another episode of this. All right, so that's, that's the end of uh, <laughs> my advice to my grandchildren. All right, ciao. Ta-ta.